Will you pray with me? O oh God, out of the busyness and out of the noise, out of the troubles of our lives and our world, we turn to you. Grant us in these moments a sense of stillness and peace. And out of that stillness and peace, may we hear your voice speaking loudly and clearly to each and every one of us singly and to all of us collectively. And then give us courage to rise and follow. In the name of Jesus, amen. According to the ancient preacher, there is a time to speak and a time to keep silent. The Desert Mothers, who are our guides and companions this month, knew the importance of both these fourth century or so women from the Middle East and North Africa, knew the importance of a healthy balance and rhythm between speaking and keeping silent. And they realize that the quality of our speaking is often directly related to and dependent upon the quality of our silence. Leaving the everyday world of home and family they knew best, they made their way out into the desert to practice and perfect the art of keeping silent. And because they did, when the time came to speak, they often had something profound to say something profound enough that their words still have relevance for us today. But what exactly do we mean by keeping silent? How and when does this happen? Is it the silence of young love and young lovers when merely basking and delighting in the glow of each other's presence is more than enough? Is it the silence of longtime partners so completely at ease and, con and content with each other that no words are needed to know what the other is thinking and feeling? Is it the silence that engulfs you in the grandeur of a winter sunset or the serenity of a summer sunrise? Is it the silence that comes when everything that can be said and everything that needs to be said has already been said, or the silence that sits heavily when you've run out of words or explanations or excuses or apologies? Is it the silence that hangs in the air as you wait to learn the results of a medical test or job interview or college application or birth announcement? Or perhaps the silence you experience in the presence of breathtaking beauty and wonder. But there are other kinds of silence too. There's the oppressive and dehumanizing silence of persons who dare not speak their mind because they are coerced into silence and the crippling silence inhabited by persons whose words and ideas and opinions are routinely, blithely, cavalierly dismissed and discounted. Or the awkward and uncomfortable silence of those who choke back their voice and fail to speak out when love and justice demand it. Or the involuntary silence that comes in the aftermath of unspeakable tragedy or horror. My guess is that the Desert Mothers knew many, if not all, of these nuanced and varied forms of silence, but the silence they practiced and advocated was of a still different sort, a silence that is devoted solely and fully to listening for the voice of the eternal, the voice 
They gave birth to the earth and every living thing in it right up to this very moment. Listening for the voice that spoke at the dawn of creation, bringing everything to life and continuing to bring life out of death, something out of nothing, hope out of despair, joy out of sorrow whenever it speaks. Essential as that voice may be, it is not easy for us to hear. Filled as our ears are with the mundane, the trivial, the inconsequential, sounds that deaden us to the mystery and wonder and joy and beauty of life itself. Following the desert mothers by turning our backs on the world and retreating to the quietness of a desert cave may not be an option for very many of us. But might we still somehow profit from their example and their wisdom? Last Sunday, Amasera was our guide. This week, it's Ama Matrona's turn. We know almost nothing about Matrona, who she was, where she came from, what brought her to the desert, what she did there, what kind of person she was. All we really know of her are two brief sayings, three sentences in total. But those sayings are well worth repeating and remembering. Saying number one, we carry ourselves wherever we go and we cannot escape temptation by mere flight. Which is to say that if you and I think the solution to our troubles or problems lies in running away, moving to a new house or community, taking a new job or going to a different church, finding new friends, new activities, new companions, a new relationship or marriage, if we think that any of those things will fix us or cure our unhappiness, we are sadly mistaken. Because the one thing that remains constant amid any and all changes is ourselves. I once knew a young person who repeatedly told me about all the persons in his life that made him unhappy and what was wrong with all of those persons. And I kept gently trying to nudge that young man into thinking about what the common denominator was in every one of those situations and interactions. And it went right past that person. Unless you and I deal straightway with ourselves, nothing else matters. At best, those other options will bring us only temporary reprieve from the difficulties or unhappiness that beset us. We carry ourselves wherever we go. Saying number two from Ama Matrona is this, many people living secluded lives on the mountain have perished by living like people in the world. It is better, she says, to live in a crowd and want to live a solitary life than to live a solitary life, but all the time be longing for company. If I thought saying number one was aimed squarely at me, saying number two runs even deeper. Truth be told, I am someone who finds my life and energy replenished sometimes by being off on my own and sometimes being, by being surrounded by people I know and love and enjoy, as well as by opportunities to meet new persons entirely. I suspect I am not alone on that score. What differs for each of us is the exact balance we need or prefer between me time and we time, between solitude and companionship. Ama Matrona recognizes our human hunger for both, but counsels that for most of us, 
being actively engaged in the world, yet longing for stillness, silence, and solitude, for time alone with God is a healthier place to be than being off alone with God, wishing we were somewhere else. In the end, it's the balance or rhythm that matters. Finding the balance or rhythm that works best for you between nurturing the human side of you that longs for human contact, conversation, companionship, and community, and nurturing the Holy Spirit that dwells in you and longs for the fullness of God's presence and blessing. The parable Jesus tells in today's scripture reading is a story about God's utter joy and delight when people find their way home to God. For rule makers and law keepers, there are two kinds of people. Those who are good and those who are bad. Those who are in and those who are out. Those who follow and play by the rules and those who don't. Those who are worthy and the, those who are not. But when challenged by the rule makers and keepers of his day, Jesus refuses to be bound by their assumptions and way of thinking. Instead, he offers a different model, a model in which everyone is recognized and infer, affirmed and accepted as a beloved child of God. And the only distinction that matters is the degree to which we welcome and buy into that or not. Whether we're moving in the direction of God and God's vision or not. What matters is not our self-proclaimed saintliness or sinfulness, because we are all a mixture of both. And as Amma Matrona reminds us, we carry that mixture into everything we do and everywhere we go. No, what matters is our willingness to let the Jesus impulse, I'm going to call it the Jesus impulse, be at work in us by seeking out those who have fallen or been brushed or shoved to the wayside by doing whatever it takes with no stone unturned to see that they are restored to wholeness and find their way home. And when that happens, by rejoicing like heaven itself. And don't just take my word for it, because when it comes to acting on the Jesus impulse, I am as thick-headed as Jesus' original disciples. I am as much of a dunderhead as anyone. As pig-headed, bull-headed, muddle-headed, and addle-brained as anyone. So here's my invitation to you. If you ever find me grousing or grumbling about the people in my life or complaining that somehow I'm getting the short end of the stick and not my rightful due. Please remind me of the many privileges I enjoy and take for granted every single day as a white, middle-class, educated, heterosexual, male, American citizen. Please remind me of the gospel of grace that belongs to everyone, including me. Please remind me of the words and message and heart of Jesus. Please remind me of the woman who would not rest until the missing had been restored and then through a grand party for everyone to join in. And please remind me of Ama Matrona, who taught that a dissatisfaction with one's spiritual life in the midst of the cares and worries and busyness of everyday living is not necessarily a bad thing. 
especially when compared to dissatisfaction with one's social life when one supposedly is seeking union with God. May it be so. May it be so.